let's start. Uh, I like the laid back attitude we have. So we start 10 minutes late, maybe tomorrow. Let's try to get here on time. And um, uh, first thing I would like to do is to uh, go through quickly the topics that we covered yesterday in the second part of my lesson. That is to say, the analysis of experimental data showing the patterns in the organization of the chromosomes in the nucleus of cells. And then I hopefully move to uh, what we can do with physics to try to understand those patterns. So you remember the, uh, the key point is that we have now technologies which enable us to, to derive so-called contact maps. The contact map is shown here. And you remember this type of quantitative data tell us what's the probability to see in contact those two sites on a chromosome. And you have data information genome-wide. And you remember, the, uh, we discussed the patterns in, in, in those uh, data. And one important discovery uh, was that uh, if you zoom along the diagonal, so you move from the 100 mega base scale so the size of an entire chromosome, to a two megabase scale, which you see means that you are zooming along the diagonal here, uh, what was observed is that uh, the matrix looks made of blocks. So this is the genome, the coordinate on the string of characters of DNA. And what we discussed is that uh, one notices that you have that region which is strongly interacting with itself, and much less with the rest of the genome. And also the neighboring region, and then the neighboring, and so on. And that gave, at the beginning, the impression that uh, human genome is composed of sort of uh, a sequence of domains which are strongly interacting with each other, uh, within themselves and not with the rest of the world. They've been named TADS, and this was the picture uh, in 2012 of our of how our chromosomes are colored. But then, uh, after showing that uh, the definition of TADS is quite phenomenological, quite uh, say brutal, and basically it's the fact that you can define some simple methods to to decide whether one region is more interacting to the left or to the right, you remember the paths are brutally defined in this way. You take a position along the genome, say that position, I, and you count how many interactions that location has to the left and to the right, and you subtract. And when you plot that quantity as a function of the position along the genome, looks like that you have coherent regions inside. So here there is a positive block. And then you have a negative one, and then another positive, and so on. And so you can, you can say this is the way tans are defined. You set a threshold, and you say, when I change sign above a threshold, I switch from one tad to the next one. You see, the number of complications that this type of heuristic definition arise because, uh, because of course, the definition depends on the threshold. And so, for instance, if you have a very high threshold, the example is the red, then you get those big tasks there. If instead you, you, you get a, a tiny threshold, then you have all those different tasks. So what are TADs? Of course, heuristic definition are not good enough. Nevertheless, you see those patterns in the data, and so they've been considered to be sort of fundamental unit of organization of our chromosomes. And what I tried to discuss um, last time at the end uh, was a, a, an attempt to uh, show that the cartoon of our chromosomes are folded, that I showed, uh, is inadequate. Because there are interactions among TADs, 
and they form higher order structures exactly as you have higher order structures in, in proteins, for instance. And what I showed you is, again, a brutal heuristic approach, which I try to summarize. It is the following. Suppose that you, whatever is the exact definition of TADS, you, you, you take your TADS in your system. Uh, the original discoverer tell us what are the TADS. And in the example shown, the TADS are the blocks along the diagonal marked by black numbers. Then, when you plot the data with a slightly better color scheme, slightly uh, a broader palette of colors, uh, but yeah, you see that it's difficult to believe that one and two are independent, are not interacting, because, because they share contacts. They have contacts one with the other. And so the idea, the approach to try to see whether those contacts are significant or not uh, was the one I mentioned yesterday at the end of my lecture. And uh, the, um, the, the way we followed uh, is the following. Take the list of your TADs, whatever they are. And then select the pair of TADs, which is the most strongly interacting. Means has the highest number of contacts with respect to all other pairs. By definition, that's the most likely candidate pair to be forming in higher order structure because they share a lot of contacts. And so we call them a higher order domain, a meta tad. And we had that domain back to the list of the other previous domains. And you iterate. And if you think about it, at each iteration, you are uh, bringing together the most likely candidate to be forming a higher order structure. And so the tree that you get in this hierarchical clustering, because you get a tree, because this is just hierarchical clustering, uh, tells you how the 3D structure is organized across levels. Now, as we discussed yesterday, this is a heuristic definition of higher order domains. Are they significant? And so I understood yesterday talking with some of you that too quickly I tried to explain why we think they are significant. Significant means do the data statistically support the fact that there are those higher order interactions? And the way we assess that is, is, is uh, through a number of measures. I want to mention only one for sake of brevity. And, and, and what we did uh, is, is the following. We want to, to run a, an hypothesis test. So we have to set an HEAL hypothesis, which is a random model, and compare the interactions we observe between those higher order domains with those you would have in the random control model. The random control model we used is the following. Take the, the high street data, take the contact probabilities, experimental data. By I, without entering too many details, I will discuss this more later on. By I, you see that there is a fading of colors towards blue uh, when you move away from the diagonal. This is telling you that if you take a point here, this corresponds to the interaction of two sites which are very distal genomically along the linear genome. This point, you see, you can, you can see it in different ways. For instance, it, this point here is interaction of that with that. So the opposite side of the chromosome. And you see that when you have two distal, genomically distal sites along the linear coordinate on a genome, when the two sides are distal, their interaction is, on average, weaker, as you expect. So the random model we built uh, is the following. You want to preserve the effects of genomic distance, because they are trivial in a sense. So you don't want to randomize fully the metrics of data, because otherwise you wash out also the effects of genomic distances. So the random model we construct to make our hypothesis test is a randomization of this contact data subdiagonal by subdiagonal. Because if you think about a subdiagonal is 
comprises all the points, all the pairs, sorry, which have the same genomic distance. And so we only scramble the entries corresponding to pairs of sites at the same given genomic distance. And we repeat that for all possible genomic distances. In such a way that the random matrix that we get has the average behavior of the original matrix. So the average value, sub-diagonal by sub-diagonal, is the same than in the original matrix. And so you preserve the average trend corresponding to the uh, genomic separation of the sites you consider. But all the other patterns are, sc are scrambling. So this is, uh, this is done in the, in the classic way uh, by bootstrapping. So the idea is the following. You, you take the entries of a sub-diagonal, and you produce a new matrix where that sub-diagonal has the entries taken from those. And you can randomly. So you, start from data. You, you start from the real data. And so you do not change the distribution of inherent in the regional data. This is called bootstrapping. And it's a, a classic bootstrapping, and it is a classical method to, to produce random models from real data. The idea is you want to use the original data to keep their, the structure of the statistical distribution, but you want to randomize their positioning in, in the system. Okay, so let's take a diagonal for the 100 variance, and we Perturb them. By perturb, I mean uh, permute them, exactly. OK. So, but so when you're doing that, you're assuming that there is interaction, but the interaction between the separation between the No, no. Uh, let me clarify this. Uh, the question was, you are assuming that there are interaction proportional to the distance. Am I? Uh, no. Uh, I, I try cl to clarify this. If you have a. If you have a signal which has a trend and you want to produce a random model of that, you have to take an account of the trend in the signal. Otherwise, you are perturbing the structure of the signal itself. This is the only thing we do. So you take a sub-diagonal, whatever is the dependency of the signal with the genomic distance, we do not make any assumption. We take that and we Permute. Exactly. No, there is no assumption. There is an observation that the average interaction decreases with genomic distance because the, the farther you move from the diagonal. So the further apart are the two, the less intense is the signal. But you are not making no assumptions on how, what's the dependence of that. Is it clear? You, you observe there is a dependence. So there is a trend in the data. You want to keep the trend, whatever it is. OK. So I understand that yesterday I've been too quick on this. Uh, so what we found at the end is the following. You take the randomized system, and you use that as a control. So when you have two domains, that one and that one, for instance, you can measure the interaction, i, that is to say, literally the number of contacts they share, in the real data and in the random control. The interaction in the random control, the one you would expect in the random system, we call it IC, control interaction. And what I'm showing you here in this plot is the ratio of the real over the random expected interaction of two domains as a function of the sides of those metatads, of those higher order domains. The size of the metatads is expressed as the number of fundamental tads they include. 
the fundamental thread is roughly half omega wide. So this scale goes from half omega to 200, which means practically decides 100 mega, practically decides on an entire chromosome. In, in green, you see the random, what would be the random expectation, and in blue, the real signal. And if TADs were not interacting with each other above background, you would expect that the blue would rapidly collapse to the green. Because you, you, as soon as you are a couple of tads apart, there is no interaction. And instead, what I concluded yesterday is that you see that the blue remains statistically significantly above noise, above the green, up to huge scale. You had a question? It's always the ratio. So the blue is real data divided expected interaction in the random model. And this is only a noise level for a comparison. What we do here is, is basically the following. You try to see what is the, in an ideal world, the, in the random system, this ratio should be one, okay? By definition of control. Control over control is one. However, in the, in the data, there are fluctuations. And that's why this goes up here. Because you want to take on account that to say whether the distance between the blue and the green is significant or not. It's just that. And so hopefully, <laughs> I've told you why. Now, the picture of how chromosomes are folded has changed. Because rather than thinking of distinct tads uh, not interacting one with the other, the picture which is emerging is of tads, whatever they are, forming higher order structure which have strong interaction one with the other. Strong means much bigger than what you would expect in a randomized controlled system. Okay, so hopefully what I showed you, uh, and by the way, the results I discussed are found in mouse cells, in human cells. It appears to be uh, systematic across high order organisms. So uh, it's not just for a specific type of cell. What I showed you, hopefully, is that uh, the impression we have from the data is that chromosomes are folded in this complicated way, hierarchical way I told you about. You see, the next question is to try to understand whether such a folding, complex folding, has biological relevance. And I want to try to guide you uh, through that. Uh, at this point, I may enter some more complex biology. If I go wild and uh, you do not understand what I'm telling, please stop me. And uh, it's ab absolutely natural. It's my fault. I'm, maybe I'm, I'm going to use terms which are hard to digest for those of you who are not exposed to biology. So let me try to get you step by step. When people discover TADS, a lot of attention was given to the boundary between tads. If you think the rational is, is, is uh, even trivial, why you have a boundary? What does a boundary correspond to? And so what people did was to focus on what, what is sitting at the boundaries between tads. What is determining the fact that that's a boundary? And the number of, of analysis, statistical analysis has been made. For instance, you discover that TAD boundaries are enriched for uh, GCs. But there are many more enrichments of TAD boundaries. I want to mention only one of those and to give you a sense of what, what is found. 
CTCF is a protein which is known to play a number of roles in, in, uh, in the functioning of the nucleus. And with technologies which are named chipset, and I'm not going to discuss in details, nowadays it's possible to measure where that protein and also other proteins are bound along the sequence. So you can tell how much of the CTC have is at position X, how much is at position X plus one, and so on. And what was observed is that CTC have, for instance, is enriched at TAD boundaries. And I tried to show you how the data tell us that. So what you do is you align all the TAD boundaries in your genome. Take all the boundaries and align the genome across the boundaries. And then measure how much of CTCF is at the left and at the right of the boundaries, and of course at the boundary itself. And measure the enrichment with what you would expect. To cut short a longer story, this is what I'm showing you here. This plot, look at the violet curve, is precisely that. Zero is where the boundary is sitting. And the violet curve is telling you how much CTC have is enriched with respect to noise, random excitation. And you see, it was discovered that CTC have is indeed enriched at tab boundaries. And the same occurs for a number of other uh, uh, signatures. I'm showing you only a few of them. This is, you see, uh, a form of POL2 polymerase, the machinery which transcribes genes. Five times I'll get back to that. Cages, I told you, is transcription, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, by now, let's forget about more complicated things. So, when we discovered major tags, the, the question was, well, okay, they may be architecturally relevant, they have strong interactions, but are they relevant also biologically? For instance, are boundaries between mated heads enriched for CTCF? And the expectation, once again, was, well, the bigger the mated head you consider, the weaker should be the enrichment, if it has no meaning. And you see instead, the green line, which is the enrichment that you find, for instance, when you only consider metatad, which are at least as large as 10 mega. So metatad, which are 20 times larger than a single fundamental. Not only the signal is not washed away, but it's even stronger. And so, since this is found consistently across a number of features, as you see, that was another first indication that there is a deep link between the way chromosomes fold and their activity. Or, to put it in a different way, if TADs, so I will show you, have a meaning from a functional point of view, well, mated TADs must be at least as important. The next question was, uh, to try to understand, to move, say, beyond the boundaries. I mean, what we try to um, highlight, and I have only one slide about that, let me see if I can show you that to you, is, is there a, a more profound link between the organization in space of chromosomes and biological signatures? So, I, I want to try to, uh, to guide you through, through this slide. I am not sure I would manage, but, but please help me in case I am not clear. So, um, this is an example of real data on chromosome 16, and what I'm showing you is a 40 mega of that chromosome. 40 mega is roughly one half of that chromosome. And what you see at the top, is uh, what would be the, what is the metatad hierarchical tree. 
constructed in, in such a terrible way I told you about. Beneath, instead, you see different other signals. These are uh, biological features which are located around, along, sorry, the sequence. Let me see if I, there's a CTCF that you have already encountered. This strip here is telling you the intensity of the color, how much CTCF is positioned at each site along the sequence. And you also see cage transcription. You see the pole to signal. And there are a number of other features which are important for reasons which I will, uh, if I have time, I will come to. But just to have a bird eye view of the data, I don't know if you see what I see, but the impression is that, first of all, the different features are correlated one with the other. Uh, I mean, this is visual, isn't it? You see that there are regions where the signal is weaker, regions where the signal is stronger. But you also see that they tend to be correlated with how the tree is, uh, is organized. For instance, you see that there is a block of high levels which correlate with the, with the big mated hut here. And that's distinct from the neighboring mated hut where instead the, the signal is weaker. This is visual impression. I'm trying to guide you through that. So to the visual impression I'm trying to, to deliver is that The way in which the hierarchy of, of a high order structure is organized is correlated with the way in which a number of biological uh, signals are distributed along the sequence. And uh, to cut short a, a longer story, the way we show that there is indeed a, a complex correlation between the two uh, is the following. You know how to measure a correlation of a function, of a value, uh, with itself along a line. I mean, if I give you CTCF, you can tell what's the correlation of CTCF at one position with CTCF at the next position, and then at nearest neighbor, and so on. And this is, a you expect, a decreasing function of the genomic distance. But now that you have the tree, you can compute correlations also in a different way. I think those of you who are paying more attention have already understood that. You can look at the correlation over the tree. Because what you can measure is not just the correlation along the linear genome, but the correlation between sites having the same distance over the, the tree. So for instance, Look at, those are, in my uh, cartoon, uh, those are four tads, neighboring tads along the linear sequence. You see the orange, this has the same genomic distance to its two neighbors along the genome, by definition. I call that one. And for instance, the orange instead is distant two from that, along the linear distance. But you can measure how far they are over the tree. So in the hierarchy of folding of higher order structures. And so you see that the tree distance of the orange from uh, the left is still one step because you have to go up one level on the tree. But instead, if you want to move to the right along the tree, you have to go up three levels. And so although their genomic linear distance is the same, this and this have the same linear distance from that, their distance on the tree is totally different. And the tree reflects the way they are folded. And so what you can measure is, for say, CTCF, in the case shown, this is lamina, so the first of those signals. I'm not telling you by now what lamina is. You can measure the correlation of CTCF or lamina with itself along the linear and you get the pink curve, how you see the correlation coefficient decreases as you expect with genomic separation. Or you can compute that over the tree. And you see the correlations over the tree, notice the log scale extends 
one order of magnitude further than those over the linear distance. And this is found systematically across a number of biological features which mark our genome. And so that was uh, an evidence that not only the genome is folded in the complex way I told you, but the way it is folded has crucial implications uh, for the functional activity of the cell. Because a number of th signals, including the presence of pol 2 transcription, CTZF, and so on, are deeply correlated with the way the hierarchy of metatase is organized. I told you that we run our experiments in, in uh, at three time points during dif neuronal differentiation. We look at uh, embryonic stem cells. Those are the pluripotent cells which give rise to all other tissues in our organism. We look at that neural precursors, and we look at that post-mitotic neurons, so say, developed neurons. And what we found is that the structure I mentioned, this higher order hierarchy, uh, is consistently found across different time points. And the impression uh, I am trying to deliver with this slide is that the overall hierarchical organization persist during neuronal differentiation, but the details can change. To try to highlight that visually without spending too long time on this. What I'm showing you here is uh, the example of the higher order metatap 3 uh, in mouse embryonic stem cells top and in neural precursor bottom for same chromosome 6. So you have the same chromosome and you look at the how the tree changes in the two. And again, by visual impression, you see that they have similarities, but not fully. Uh, you can measure a stupid measure of correlation between trees is the cofinetic correlation, which is 84, 0 0.84, so 84%. And, and, and this is representing the the they say the degree of similarity between the two trees. And to cut short a long story, what you see is that the overall structure is more or less conserved, but there are important changes. The color scheme at the center tells you whether the local region there is conserved or not. And you see there are regions which are well conserved. That portion of the tree is really the same in, in the other cell type. And there are regions which said they're changing. And to cut short a longer story, what do we try to, understood, to understand is whether there is a, a connection between changes in activity in transcription and changes in the architecture. Because the naive expectation would be, well, I change the architecture, I change the structure, and I have a change of activity. And what we found is that it's much subtler than that. No, the correlation is not so simple. What we found, though, is that if you consider a conserved niche in the two cell types, then if you take a tent within the niche and you look how it changes it acti its activity, well, the other tents in the conserved niche tend to behave in the same way. So, for instance, if this goes up, the others also tend to go up. So within conservative niche, there is a coherent change of activity from a transcription point of view, but only within uh, conservative niche and only statistically, which means that you may have a lot of exceptions. So uh, Up to now, I try to summarize for you some key results on how chromosomes are folded on themselves. Of course, we have a number of chromosomes, and so what are the interactions across chromosomes in the nucleus? And I think I already briefly mentioned that uh, yesterday. The picture which is emerging is, uh, is roughly summarizing by that figure. Uh, in this figure, a ball is a chromosome. And what, what this 
schematically represented this the network of contacts uh, of that chromosome. So this is a zoom, and this stupid network you see there is nothing more than a representation of the contacts. So when you see a link between two sites, uh, that's because there is a contact. And so this opens to all, to all what you know about applications of networks and so on to this type of content matters and so on. But nevertheless, the key take home message is that the network of contacts within a chromosome is much stronger than contacts across chromosome, two orders of magnitude. So there is a, as you expect from the territories of chromosomes that I showed you yesterday, there are strong interaction within a chromosome. Those are real, how to say, architectural determinants of folding. But then, this picture roughly summarizes the picture which is emerging, that is to say that distinct chromosomes also tend to interact in, non, in a non-random way. So there are also contacts across chromosomes. And so the nucleus can be seen as a, the final hierarchy of those networks, of those trees I showed you before, which uh, is in fact a network of the distinct nets of contacts within each chromosome. And the system is organized at a global scale. This is the impression which you, we have today. So, um, you have already seen that, so to give you a break and to try to summarize what, I, what I'm trying to show. So hopefully, the, I convey the message that um, the organization, the 3D organization of chromosomes is crucial for functional purposes. Because even at the scale of single genes, so within the tat, you have that uh, the regulators of the gene and the gene have to enter in contact. And so there is a, an organizational scale really at the level of single genes. And then you see from the data that such an organization extends across scales from the scale of tads to the scale of mated tads, comprising entire chromosomes, up to, of course this is a nucleus, uh, up to uh, comprising functional, non-random interactions across chromosomes in a global organization. Formidable, if you think about it, really formidable. And the way life is, the way our cells are controlled, it's in some way written in such a formidable organization. So, So, uh, what I would start now, and then in some minutes we have a real break, uh, is, to, is to enter the second part of my lectures, that is to say, how we can understand the patterns I discuss with you, not just by heuristic approaches and some clustering algorithm or whatever, by hard physics, so from the pr principles of physics. And uh, the second part of my lectures will be on that. And I try to guide you through the steps which um, have been made in the literature to date. Uh, so, uh, I insist. I, throw, I think I, I, I convey the frustration I have with, uh, with um, heuristic definition of patterns and so on. Because, you know, um, you can find them. You see them. So they are there. But defined heuristically, you never know what you're looking at. And so what, whatever you extract, you never know if you can trust it or it depends on the definition and, and, and so on. That's why in this field, uh, physics is helping... Uh, is giving 
important contribution to try to understand what are the mechanisms, which are, what are the real definitions of the patterns, what's the origin of the patterns, and so on. And that's why there is an important quest for fundamental theories of those patterns. What are the mechanisms, the fundamental mechanisms originating such patterns? So I, to, to guide you through um, that, uh, let me start again from, from an analysis of the bare experimental data. And what I show, I'm showing you here is uh, uh, what you asked at the beginning. So what is the, how the average contact probability decays within a chromosome as a function of the genomic distance? This is the following. On the y-axis, you have the probability that two sites are in contact as a function of their genomic distance. This is genomic distance, S. This is counter probability. And when you average over all the chromosomes in the system, you get the blue curve. And the, this was already, of course, noted in the first paper, which, which uh, introduced the high C technology where the data I'm considering derived from. And you see, the, uh, that was exciting because uh, you have a sort of power law behavior. In fact, I think we have to be very critical about power laws. But at least as a first impression, you see straight line in a log log plot. Then if you look at it, it is more complex than that. Because you see, maybe there is a power law. The authors of that paper found a power law in that range, which is one decade. And you know, in a log-log scale, practically whichever function in a one decade is, is a power law. But nevertheless, if you want to find a power law, yes, uh, there is a, a power law behave it there. And the problem with that power law is that it is uh, close to 1 or minus 1. It, the reason why that's a problem is because if you take the basic models of polymer physics that uh, I think, I hope Angelo introduced, for instance, the self-avoiding walk model of polymer physics. Have you heard about that? Do you, do you know what is a self-avoiding walk? Okay. Everybody? Not everybody, but it's the, it's how to say, it's the gold standard of non-interacting polymers model, the self avoiding one. It's essentially a, a, a random chain that cannot overlap with itself. That's why it's the gold standard of non-interacting <laughs> polymer physics. Anyway, if you take a self avoiding walk as a model for a polymer, you expect that the exponent is 2.1 in three dimensions. And so very far from what is seen here. And that's why uh, a quest started to search what could be a polymer model which describes the data. And what you see here in uh, brownish is a, what has been dubbed the fractal globule model of chromosomes. The fractal globule is a, is a non equilibrium, transient state that you obtain for some polymers when you start from the right initial conditions. So, for instance, if you take a self avoiding walk and you compress it in a very <coughs> small sphere and then you release the constraint, if you look how the system evolves in time, there is a time window where you have this fractal globule behavior. I'm trivializing something slightly more complicated. But more or less, this is it. There is a transient window in time where a self avoiding work polymer goes through if you have it starting from the right initial conditions. Well, the matter is that within that window of time, uh, if you measure the exponent of the fractal globule, it is one. And you see, it fits decently well, uh, the data. It's not really 1.1, but close to it. 
And so at the beginning, there was an enthusiasm. Well, we have understood how chromatin folds. It's a fractal globule. But then, a number of complications arise. The first is shown here. So, suppose you take a self avoiding book or a fractal globule model. By definition, their contact matrix is featureless. Because by definition, they are uniform. And these contacts are random. And so there's no reason to see anything else, just a genomic distance effect. So you capture, at least in one decade, the decay of the average contact probability with the average genomic distance. But all the patterns, all the tads, all the action in the data is fully lost. And so it became clear that fractal globule cannot be a motor for chromatin or a fully general motor for chromatin. It may happen that in some circumstances, some portion of some chromosome does behave as a fractal globule, but it is not the general motor. In the, and what we showed is that there are a number of evidences uh, for that. For instance, if you look at the data in details, you don't take the genomic average, but you look at different chromosomes separately, you see that even at the level of the average probability, so you are forgetting about the patterns, but even if you look at the average probability, different chromosomes or uh, different organisms have different power laws. This is the different colors are different data from different cell types. And you see, if you want to fit with a power law, you can, but that's depend on the system. And what is shown, what I'm showing you here is the different chromosomes. Take one example, take this. In red, you have the, the average across chromosome, but then if, if you look at distinct chromosomes, uh, you see, they deviate around that. And so each chromosome has its own exponent. So this is crashing. A theory which has a single possible universal confirmation for everything. If you look at the details of the system, they are dependent on the cell type, on the chromosome you consider, and so on. And so the quest was, how can we reconcile that with a simple uh, description? Can we get back to statistical mechanics, to polymer physics, and explain the data? And this is what I want to do, but after a time is it now? I can see. Then I always forget. Uh, our lecture goes up to. Ten forty-five. So shall we have a, four, a fifteen minutes break? See you here, please, sharply at a quarter past ten. Thank you. There is a, a secret entrance there. No. Can you go out from there? No, no. Not at all. Oh, okay. So, um, the starting point to try to build first principle theories of how chromosome fold. Was, uh, was roughly the following. If we want to understand why chromosomes take the shape they take, from a physics point of view, we have to focus on what are the mechanisms which produce the interaction, exactly as we do in normal physics. And so a scenario of course, is the one which is depicted in my slide. That is to say that 
two DNA sites enter in, in contact because there is a molecule, something, which is holding them together. And so that scenario is summarized uh, by this strings and binders mode. That, in fact, we introduced before high C data became available. And the idea is literally nothing more of what I said here. So you have binders. Those molecules are binders. And as you understand from the color scheme, you have, say, for instance, green binders which can reach green regions along the polymer, and red binders which can reach red regions. And what I want to discuss with you is step by step the advancements which were possible within this framework. And if I have time later today or I guess tomorrow, uh, I'll, I'll discuss other mechanisms which we think are important in folding of chromosomes. So the scenario is, is the one I, uh, I, I mentioned before. And it's this. Take a, a, a piece of a chromosome. You model that polymer with the gold standard of polymer physics, which is the self-avoiding work that Angelo discussed. So literally, the strings of beads, which cannot overlap one with the other. The variant, though, with respect to the self-avoiding work model is that along the chain, there are binding sites here marked in dark red for the binders of the strings and binders mode. So the string is the polymer, and those are the binders. And the binders can only bridge pairs of sites with the same color. That's it. So this is a, a standard uh, model of an interacting polymer. I don't know if Angelo has delved into that. No. OK. We'll go step by step. So what's the idea? Suppose that this is a model, a good model for folding on chromosome. It's clearly oversimplified. But let's have it as a sort of starting point. The idea is that we can use Newton equation, the Hamiltonian of the system, to predict how the system folds, and then try to guess if that explains the data or not. So the first step I would like to do with you is to explain, just the, say, uh, the basic physics of this type of interacting polymer models. So suppose that to let you understand what, what is going on here. Suppose you have no binders in this model. So you have no of those particles. You understand that if at the end you have a freely uh, and randomly arranged polymer, because the polymer subject to thermal fluctuation just move around, moves around, and there's no constraint, and you have literally nothing more than a randomly folded chain. That's it. That conformation, if you think about it, is a thermodynamic state because the system spontaneously folds in that way. If you strengthen the polymer and you let it go, it naturally refolds into such a random conformation. So that's the thermodynamic state of the system. And that's called the coil state of the polymer or the open state. And so that's the state shown here. This is the system phase diagram, the simplest phase diagram of the system. It's slightly more complex than that. So you see on the x-axis, there is the concentration of binders. It's called CM. So how many of those you have? If you have no binders, as in my example, you are far on the left on this axis. And the other control parameter you immediately understand is the interaction strength. This is the y-axis here. So this is the binding energy. How strong is the interaction between a binder and the cognate binding site? If you have no interaction energy, of course, there's no interaction, so the polymer is free again. And so at low 
binding energy, again, you are in the thermodynamic state where the polymer is randomly folded and open. Now you see from the diagram that there is another thermodynamic state. Because, let me see if I have a picture to show. Yeah, I have a picture. Suppose you start from the open state and you start adding binders. If you have a binder, you can have a situation as the one described above. So you have a binder, whatever it is, and by chance, you can indeed form a bridge and then loop the polymer. Because what happens is that the binder floating around randomly finds it, its target, first target, locates there, and by chance, another red binding site floating may collide with that, and a bridge is formed. Now, if you think about it, this, is very unlikely. And tropically very disfavored. Because you have to have that the binder finds its target by chance. Before moving away, the other has to come, find in the space exactly the same location and bridge. Very, very unlikely. That's why the phase diagram has a broad region with the open state. Because if you start increasing the binder concentration, that's not enough to fold your polymer. At the beginning, it doesn't succeed. But then a phase transition occurs. And I try to explain you why you have a phase transition. Suppose now you increase the concentration of binders. You have a lot of binders there. And suppose that by chance, you form a first bridge as before. Once you have formed the first bridge, if you have locally many other binders, the chance that you form a second bridge are much higher because those two are already close by. And so locally, if you have other bridging molecules, it's easy to form a second bridge. But the second bridge reinforces the first and helps the formation of a third. So you see there is a threshold point in concentration above which, once you have formed the first contact, that helps the assembling of the others. And so there is literally a transition point where the entropy loss due to the collapse of the loops of the polymer is balanced by the energy gain that you have in forming all those bridges. So it's an energy entropy balance as in standard phase transitions. And the other phase which is uh, entered is called the globular or compact phase of the polymer. Compact because the conformation that the polymer takes is, is much more compact than the open one because all those bridges are formed, and so the, the polymer is looped on itself. And that's the thermodynamic phase transition. And that occurs at a transition point. In fact, it is a line, because you see it depends also on the affinity. And that transition line is called the theta point of the polymer. Uh, you enter the new thermodynamic phase. In here, we have the power of statistical mechanics, whereby you know that there are universality classes. So those major uh, thermodynamic phases correspond to a vast class of polymer models. You know that they are not affected by the tiny details of the model. That's why I didn't even mention exactly what is the type of bonding that you have here. It is Leonard Jones or shifted Leonard Jones, a hydrogen bond, whatever. If you have interactions, the concept of Nobel Prize winning, concept of universality, let us know that those are independent, the structure of phase diagram, those, the properties of those phases, thermodynamic phases, are independent on the tiny model details. And that's why 
we have a hope that even with very simplified models, such as the easing model for magnetism, we can explain much more complex cases, such as the folding of real chromosomes. And so the advantage we have with respect to biologists is that we know that there is a Nobel Prize for universality. We know that there is a Nobel Prize for self folding work and, and polymer physics and so on. And we know the power of that. With very simple models, we can hopefully try to describe from very simple principles what is happening in folding. And when this was understood, uh, an important step ahead was made. Because uh, you can make sense now. You can, you, you can do as we do, if, uh, we theoretical physicists do in high energy physics. You can tell, well, what's the energy range where you expect this type of phase transition to occur? What's the concentration of factors you expect? And that's shown here. You see that the binary concentration is multiple of nanomoles per liter. Now, of course, I'm not delving into those numbers in details. But what is interesting is that those numbers correspond to known typical concentration of binding factor, CTCF, in the nucleus of cells. In the energy range, a few units in KBT at room temperature is hydrogen bonds. So exactly what you expect, weak biochemical energies for the formation of this type of interactions. You don't want permanent bonds, because this is a regulatory mechanism. So you want to form it when you have to activate a gene, and you want to deliver it, to, to open it when you want to deactivate the gene. So you don't want uh, strong covalent bonds. You want hydrogen bonds. You want weak bonds of biochemistry. And so the theory naturally predicts that this type of phase transition happens in the right energy and concentration range, as much as, say, the standard model predicts that the Higgs boson must be at a given energy range and so on. And there is, if this is true, if this is true, there is another in intriguing fact that we can understand how the cell controls those changes of conformation. Suppose you want to activate a gene. You want to bring the regulator in contact with the gene. How you do that in a without fine-tuning, in, in, in a robust and sharp way. You want to be sharp because that's vital. You want to activate the gene. How do you control that? In this scenario, we understand this out of statistical mechanics because you have a phase transition. And so, for instance, suppose that at the beginning you have no binders in the system and you start producing binders. Because this is a phase transition, you have a threshold point. And if you are below the transition, although you may have binders around, by chance you produce the, a binder, you are not folding your polymer. You are in the open state. But as soon as you cross the threshold, the phase transition point, you don't need to fine tune to decide exactly how many particles there were. No. If you cross the threshold, you fold. You change state. You activate the gene 100% and shock it. So if the scenario is correct, we may understand how the cells can easily control such a complex processes as those I, I described. So the theory has a number of appealing uh, uh, elements in it. But let's test this theory. Because we can now make quantitative predictions and compare with the experiments, because we have quantitative data exactly as much as in atomic physics, in high energy physics, there are hard quantitative data against which we can compare our models. Here we have the same. This is a perfect scenario of theoretical physics. So this is just to say that the phase diagram is more complex. I don't want to delve into that. Otherwise, we never get out of this live. Uh, I want, though. <coughs> No, this is. Uh, I didn't. I, had, I didn't have to show this, but uh, quickly. Uh, what you have is that there are, according to the interaction strength, you have that the system forms also uh, ordered 
arrangements. So it's not randomly, it's not a random lump, the one I do for, but it is more ordered, very quickly. So to make a comparison with the data, uh, I want to show you how the counter probabilities, first the average counter probability uh, changes uh, in this toy model in the different thermodynamic phases. No, uh, I understand your question. The, uh, what I said is that this is the number of binder. This, oh, yes, of course. Absolutely. But what is, uh, of course, what you are saying is, uh, is that, well, if you have no binding size, you cannot fold the polymer. So this is, a, in principle, another ingredient. So what's the density of those? To cut short a longer story, if you think about what matters, it's the, it's the product of the affinity and the numbers, because that's the total binding energy you can gain. Uh, and so for simplicity, I'm not showing that. But yes, that's another parameter in principle. I'll get to that. Because you see, now we can predict. As much as in high energy physics, you can tell, well, I expect those particles acting at, at that energy scale and producing that interaction, here we can do exactly the same. So I will come to that, if I have time. Uh, so very quickly, if you want to compare a model with, with experiments, first of all, we have to uh, see how the average counter probabilities uh, are found in this toy model I'm showing you. And this is a, uh, how that behaves. This is the average counter probability in the toy model I showed you before, the one, the string with the binders, one color, as a function of the <laughs> genomic distance, the, the distance along the polymer, I should say. And as you know, from the universality concepts of polymer physics and phase transitions, the counter probability only depends on which thermodynamic phase you are in. So it doesn't depend on details on exactly how many binders you have, exactly how many binding sites you have. If you are in the open state, it's one thing. If you are in the other thermodynamic states, it's another thing. And the two things are shown here. So what you see is that, again, quickly illustrating the, the concept. If you are in the open state, the counter probability, the average counter probability with genomic distance is indeed the power law, and you know the exponent. It's the self avoiding walk exponent, 2.1 in three dimensions. And now you see it's really a power law over a few decades, not just fractional. And this is all well expected in, in the good old polymer physics of the 80s be even earlier. If you transit into the other thermodynamic state, in the globular state, if you think about the structure changes, and so the counter probability changes, and is more like the pink one. This, this violet is at the theta point, roughly. And the point is that those counter probabilities, at least the, the general behavior, does not depend on the details. And so it's either one or the other. Analogously, you have that, no. Uh, so what the idea we proposed is that if you take a chromosome, it is a very complex thing. You've seen that there are complex patterns of molecules bound to its CTC, have fold two and so on. And so what we propose is that one chromosome is not in a single state but it is a mixture of pure states. The idea is that along a single chromosome, you may have a portion which is in the compact because you have to activate the genes there, and another which is in the open phase because you have to not activate the genes there. So a single chromosome is a sequence of different uh, folding states. And if you have a population of cells, a given locus, a given region can be open in one and closed in the other. 
So when you look at high C data, in fact, what you have is a mixture, as if you have a paramagnet and a ferromagnet mix it together and you look at the average properties. And so, at the beginning, to our surprise, such a stupid, basic polymer physics models explained the data to an extent uh, which was, in, say, unexpected. This is real data. So this is the average counter probability I already discussed it before. In this case, the different colors are different cell types. In this case, the different colors are different chromosomes. And uh, this is the average counter probability versus genomic distance. And it's roughly two, three decades. The gray region is the one where you could fit with a single power law, which was nevertheless dependent on the system, the chromosome, and so on. And instead, with, by combining, you, you take those two curves from textbooks. This is standard polymer physics. You don't even need to compute them. By having a mixture of those two, I say 50% of cells in one state, 50% in the other, or 50% of regions in one and 50% in the other, you see that you can fit, considering that you have only one fitting parameter, the, the fraction in the mixture, you can fit comparatively well essentially all the data available, all the average data available to date. So this was an indication that maybe such a stupid simple model is not too far from, from reality. You can also understand why you have bendings and it's not a power law, that's why it depends on the system. It depends on the system because, and it is well known in, in biology, there are chromosomes which are very gene rich. There are chromosomes which are instead are very gene poor. And so you expect that they have differences. And, and this is what you, what you recover with this type of approach. Uh, so does the It's, it's uh, I, I try to answer, I, see, I think I see what you mean. But the reason why I say that there is one parameter is that those two functions, the counter probability, the average counter probability in the open and in the compact state are universal. So it's modal independent. If you are in the open state, you find one. If you are in the other state, you find the other. So you have no fitting parameters or, in fact, I am exaggerating because the little details where the plateau sets in, this kind of things depend on the model. They are not universal. But if you take the universal part of those, it's given by basic polymer physics. You don't even need to, any interacting polymer has a coil to global transition. You decide which polymer model you want, but then you get those. And so what you need to, to produce those fits is only deciding what's the composition of the mixture. I don't know if I'm expressing myself. However, you're right, of course, the Technically speaking, the modal parameters are those I discussed before. Uh, number of binding sites, concentration of binders, binding affinity, plus the mixture composition. No. Uh, at this point, we start with the predictions. So, say, this is chromosome 19. What's the mixture which best fits chromosome 19? And we derive that. And then we compare that with what you know from biology. And it turns out that chromosome 19 is comparatively open because it's uh, for its biological properties. It's known in biology, et cetera, et cetera. Chromosome X tend to be compact. It's known that in females in particular, one of two X chromosomes is completely compactified for reason I'm not explaining. It's called X chromosome activation. We infer the, the fraction by fitting from first principles to data, and we discover once again that the fraction that we extract are, makes sense against other biological knowledge. With this type of models, you can also investigate other data, such as fish data, why we want to limit to, uh, to high C. 
Fish data is data instead based on microscopy. Fish is the following. You attach fluorescent probes to two positions on a chromosome, and you, for instance, measure the, the distance. And you can measure, for instance, how the distance of the two probes depend on how far the two probes are on, on a chromosome. And you have tons of data like that. And this is briefly summarized what the strings and binders model predicts. Again, you expect the mean squared distance between the two probes in the strings and binders model depends on which thermodynamic phase you are in. In the open phase, guess what? It is a power law with the standard known self evolving work exponent, 0 0.588 in three dimensions. And instead, in the compact state, it, it, it has a sort of plateauing. And, uh, and this is real data. This is data in different types of cells, different chromosomes. And you see how the mean squared distance between two probes on the same chromosome depends on the genomic distance of the two chromosomes. And this is the this data, real data. That, the black line is the prediction of the strings and binders model. And the dashed line is the, what the, you remember I mentioned the structural globule, what that would predict. So nothing to do. And once again, we, again, with no additional hypothesis and so on, you can fit also fish data. But one striking set of data, which was particularly, I think, interesting, at least to me personally, uh, is the one I'm showing now. This is really now, we are delving into polymer physics. What I'm showing you here is the so-called moment ratio. This is the ratio of the average square distance squared and the average of the fourth power of the distance of the two probes. This quoted in polymer physics is, is crucial because this is dimensionless. So either your model predicts that correctly or not. And I'll show you the comparison between strings and binders and uh, real data. So what I'm showing you here is fish data, so real experimental data on that moment ratio taken from that reference. Uh, and, the, uh, and you see this moment ratio experimentally is found to be scattered, but more or less it has a sort of support line at roughly 1.5. If you think about this, it's surprising because you could think, well, the moment ratio is whatever, could be anything. And instead, if I look at this stair to the data, you see that they, are, they have an accumulation point at 1.5. Why? We understand this out of thermodynamics. Because look instead on the right what is predicted by the strings of minus mode. Once again, you know from statistical mechanics that when you are well within a thermodynamic state, the world is Gaussian. And so the moment ratio must, must be three halves. And in fact, it is three halves in the open and in the compact phase. And as you know, when you go through the theta point, the transition point, that changes and grows. And look, this is dimensionless grows up to a scale of roughly five, roughly five. So you see there is a complete correspondence between such a dimensionless quantity. So totally independent of any parameter you have in your model. This is dictated by the fundamental theory of statistical mechanics that fluctuations are Gaussian in the, in the depth of thermodynamic phases. And you explain the, the range of, of values observed. And you explain why there is a this sort of uh, limiting point at three hours from above. And so if we take this seriously, this is telling us that, wow, indeed, it looks like that different regions, different portions of chromosomes tend to be around the thermodynamic equilibrium in one of the thermodynamic phases allowed. But if we take this seriously, this is predicting, this comparison is predicting, but the reason why you have values which scatter up may be because in a cell, you have regions which are close to the theta point. They are changing, they are regulating, they are opening or closing. And so we, make, we could make sense 
of the existence of also of that other thermodynamic state in, in real cells. This is, I was very, very excited by that, as you see from my talking about that, because of the fact that you have no fitting parameters here, and you have a fantastic uh, limit in the data, and, and you explain that so naturally by just invoking the Gaussian property of fluctuations in, in, in uh, thermodynamic phases. Okay. But now I want to make the further step. Uh, what I discussed to date is, uh, is um, is the average properties. So if I want to know, on average, what's the counter probability as a function of the genomic distance, or the average distance, physical distance as a function of the genomic distance, we can derive that from basic concepts of polymer physics. But what about the patterns in the data? Because the patterns is the action. When I see a spot of interaction, that's because an answer is contacting a gene. And I want to predict that. So let me try to guide you through how we think those patterns can arise. So we want to explain not just the average behavior with genomic distance, but also why you have blocks of interactions and so on, and what they are and so on. And again, the problem with the fractal global and, and the other simple model I told you about is that they are patternless, featureless. No, no, no regulator interacting with no answers, all this sort of random mess. So in the remaining part of this lesson, I want to try to give you a glimpse without entering technical calculations for that. I would like to give you a glimpse of how patterns can be obtained. And then the next uh, and final, hopefully, lecture tomorrow, I'll wrap up. Let me try to guide you through this. Suppose you have a variant of the stupid toy model I showed you before. So now, rather than having a polymer with one type of binding site, red, and one type of binders, red. You have another segment in the toy model with green binding sites and green binders. To this audience, I have not to explain what is happening. You immediately understand that the two different segments have their own thermodynamic phase transitions. And so, for instance, if you go into the compact state, into the globular state, the system spontaneously folds in that structure where you clearly see the formation of a red and the green uh, lump, just because they are taken together by their own uh, corresponding uh, ranging factors, red and green binders, respectively. And if you compute the contact matrix in this toy model, trivial at this point, uh, you have a pattern of squares. And you know that. Because the reds are interacting only with the red. And the only reason why the, you have some remaining interactions with the green is by chance. The two blocks are not fully independent because there is a the polymer which is linking the two. But that's it. So average content maps, that one. And visually, it recalls tans. How you obtain more complex patterns. Once again, it's just a matter of understanding what's the Hamiltonian. Suppose you take that toy model and you add a third color, but now the blue. But now the blue binding sites are interspersed with both the red and the green. Even trivial now, you understand that the two blocks start interacting one with the other. In fact, it's slightly, there is something which is non-trivial, because what turns out is that, is that the, the two blocks, the red and the green, remains together. And if you think about that's a matter of proximity. So you first fold the red and the green, and then the blue glue the two. I don't know if I'm expressing myself. It's non-trivial that you keep the two substructures, and the two substructures are then glued, bridged by the blue. But this is what is happening, and now, polymer physics starts, starts playing a slightly more exciting role. And in this system, if you map the content matrix, it looks like that. So you have two blocks as before, and we know that. But you see that there are higher interactions between the two blocks, just because you have blue binding sites and blue binders, which can bridge the two blocks. And so you see 
This is a higher order domain. This is what is written into the data, if this model is correct. TADS would be just distinct globular structure produced by specific particle image. And I will come back to that. And this is instead by the fact that you have particles which also mediate interaction between the distinct blocks. And so we can make sense of TADS, metatads, and so on. But I don't want to leave you with the impression that this is all when waving. We can explain experimental data 95% with this. And this will be the topic of the lecture I will give tomorrow and, and, and see you then, unless you have questions. Okay. <clears throat>